On May 18th, 1980, there was a, an incredible explosion which was estimated to be 500 times more powerful than the force of the atomic bomb that uh, leveled Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Uh, the explosion occurred in the state of Washington, and it was so powerful that it ripped 1,200 feet off the top of a 9,700-foot volcano known as Mount St. Helens. And although the mountain had been dormant for 123 years, within minutes the incredible power was unleashed. Thousands of tons of volcanic ash were thrust into the atmosphere. The cloud of ash literally turned day into night in the surrounding communities. Communities were virtually immobilized as from four to six inches of this powdery substance fell like a winter snowstorm. What was once considered prime hunting and fishing land was decimated. 26 lakes, 154 miles of streams, 195 square miles of pristine forest. But Mount St. Helen was not a very powerful volcano, especially compared to the one that erupted in 1883, Mount Krakatoa in Indonesia. It erupted with a force that was equal to 30 hydrogen bombs. The power from Mount St. Helens was estimated at 500 atomic bombs. One hydrogen bomb is equal to 1,000 atomic bombs. So Mount Krakatoa was equal to 30,000 atomic bombs. Mount Krakatoa was 60 times more powerful than Mount St. Helens. During the eruption of Mount Krakatoa, tidal waves killed 36,000 people in Java and Sumatra, and a cloud of ash cooled the Earth's climate for almost two years. You know, what we've seen in these natural eruptions of power is just a very, very small example of greater forces at work in the universe. Though we've come a, a long way in our understanding of the forces that shape our world, we still haven't even graduated from preschool. From the time when dynamite was first produced in 1867 by Alfred Nobel until the time of the present day of discovery of quantum physics, we've learned a lot. But all that knowledge combined only gives us a very tiny clue to what the real power in this universe is like. Attempts are made from time to time to describe the power contained in the universe. The truth, though, is that man hasn't even begun to comprehend the limitless power of God. This morning, as we continue following the track of the Ark of the Covenant of God, after its capture by Israel's enemies, we're going to again see the hand of God at work as he demonstrates his power in our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. Lord, as we open it up this morning, Father, I pray that you would be in the midst of it. Lord, that we would get just, just a glimpse of the power that you have. Father, we could never understand it. We have finite minds. And your power is infinite. But Father, help us to understand. Help us to see just a glimpse of who you are. A glimpse of how powerful you are. Father, that we might understand that you have the power of life and death. Father, I pray that you would be in the midst of this time. Open our hearts, open our minds to hear from you this morning. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 6. And if you're using one of the Black Pew Bibles, I believe it starts on page 266. Now, last week, we looked at a couple of ways that God displayed his power after the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. The Philistines took the Ark, 
and they, they placed it at the feet of the statue of Dagon, their chief god in his temple. But in the morning, they found Dagon face down, lying on the ground before the ark of God. And they set Dagon back up. But on the second morning, not only was Dagon back on the ground, but his head and his hands were chopped off. In this, we see that God has power over false gods. <clears throat> we also saw that wherever the Philistines moved the ark, the people developed tumors and devastation broke out. By the time the leaders of the Philistines moved the ark to Ekron, the people cried out for it to be taken away before it ever even arrived. They had seen what had happened in other places, and they did not want to be subjected to the death and the plagues that came along with the ark. And the last verse of chapter 5 tells us that in their distress, the outcry of the city went up to heaven. And so we recognize that God has power over the enemies of his people. God's power was not confined to working in Israel. Truthfully, he is God everywhere. And that's where we left off last week. This morning, we need to recognize that, that the Philistines had a problem. They had the ark. They wanted to return the ark, but they didn't know how to go about it. And so what they did, they, they, they'd seen the power of God up close. They didn't want anything to do with it. They didn't want to do something that would provoke God even further and result in even worse, worse consequences for Philistia. So they called together their religious experts in order to figure out what to do. So let's see, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory for seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, If you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it away empty, but by all means send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed. And you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, what guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors and of the rats that are destroying the country and pay honor to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? When he treated them harshly, did they not send the Israelites out so that they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pin them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. And in a chest beside it, put the gold objects you're sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us and that it happened to us by chance. So they did this. They took two such, such cows and hitched them to the cart and pinned up their calves. And they placed the ark of the Lord, of, uh, of the Lord on the cart along with it, uh, the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned 
that same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumors the Philistines sent as a guilt offering to the Lord. One each for Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of the Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers, the fortified towns with their country villages. The large rock on which they set the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the fields of Joshua, in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. So the advice of the religious experts was to send the ark back accompanied by a guilt offering to God. The idea was to appease God for the wrong that they had done to him by capturing and mishandling the ark. The NIV translation here implies that by doing so, God will heal them. But the Hebrew underneath that is conditional, that he might heal you, then you might be healed. In any case, it seems that the experts were unsure of their advice. And the people ask for more specific answers. What should we send? And the experts suggest sending golden replicas of the tumors that they had been suffering from, and also the golden rats, since they had been infested with those as well. And they were to send one, of, one for each of the Philistine cities. Then perhaps, perhaps God would remove the plague from the people. Perhaps he would heal their land. The experts then make an analogy between the Philistines and Pharaoh. And by doing so, we become aware of several reminders of the story of the Exodus that are lurking just under the surface here. The verb to send away is the same word that was used many times for Pharaoh's dismissal of Israel from Egypt. It's the word used by Moses when he said, let my people go. The ark's departure from Philistia would, in some sense, be like the departure of Israel from Egypt. The Israelites didn't go from Egypt empty-handed. They took gold and silver and jewelry from the Egyptians with them. In the same way, the ark was not to go empty-handed. Gold objects were sent along with it. The plagues of tumors and, and rats have come to the Philistines just as the plagues came to Egypt. The question is whether these plagues will be enough or if there was going to be a whole gamut of plagues that are needed before the ark is released. The Philistines were told to give honor to God. It's another echo from Exodus. God said, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. The hardened hearts of the Philistines point back to the hardened heart of Pharaoh. A hardened heart describes defiance against God. Such a defiance brings judgment as the Egyptians learned and as the Philistines are now experiencing. The only answer for the Philistines was to send away the Israelites. Likewise, the Philistines must send away the ark. In spite of all that, and in spite of the calamities that have followed the ark throughout Philistia, the Philistine uh, uh, religious experts are still not convinced that the troubles that they've been experiencing were brought about by the God of Israel. They contrived a way to determine whether or not that was true. They created a situation in which there was a high probability, almost immense probability of failure that only the power of God could bring about to a different outcome. The people were to hitch two cows to a brand new cart that they were to build. They would bring two milk cows. They were going to send it on its way to Beth Shemesh. And if the cart makes it to Beth Shemesh, then they'll know that it was God that brought the disaster. But if not, then it was just a coincidence that all of those disasters struck while the ark was being moved around. 
but the people couldn't use just any cows. They had to use milk cows that had never been yoked. And to make matters worse, they were supposed to have just calved, and pin, they were going to pin up the calves near their mothers. Understand now, the two cows that have never been yoked, that have not been trained to pull a cart, are not likely to cooperate. They're going to be wanting to go all kinds of different directions. And furthermore, cows that are feeding their young wouldn't willingly leave their calves behind. But the people did what they were told to do. And they hitched up the cows, loaded up the ark, loaded up the golden tumors and the, and the rats, and they sent the cart on its way. And then the most amazing thing happened. The cart... <clears throat> went straight up the road to Beth Shemesh. Didn't veer one way, didn't veer the other way. It was like they were driving up the lane of a highway. But we need to notice something about the way that the cattle traveled. Our passage says that they are lowing the whole way. That is, they are complaining the whole way to Beth Shemesh. They weren't going because they wanted to go. It was almost as if they were being driven against their natural inclinations by a power that was beyond them. If, of course, they were. The cattle continued on their way until they came to a field in Beth Shemesh where some Israelites were harvesting their wheat and the cattle pulled the cart right up next to a large rock. And they stopped right there. And the people who were harvesting, they heard the ruckus that was being made by the cattle. And they look over and they saw the, car, the ark and they rejoiced that the ark was back. The glory of the Lord may have departed Israel for a while, but God had not abandoned his people. And in this scene, we see that God demonstrated that he has power over nature. You know, it's interesting that the ark <clears throat> was sent to Beth Shemesh. The Philistines probably didn't know it, but Beth Shemesh was one of the towns that was given to the Levites and to the priests when Joshua divvied up the land that the people got when they crossed over to, into the promised land. This meant that there were men there who could rightly handle the ark of God, when God brought it back. And they removed the ark, and they removed the chest full of golden objects, and they broke up the cart, and they offered the cows as burnt offering to the Lord, and worship broke out among the people. The Philistine leaders, they saw all of that, and they went back to Ekron, now convinced that it was the hand of God that had brought about the plagues. Man, it would be nice. It would be nice if that was the end of the story. But, but it's not. Unfortunately, it goes on. Verses 19 through 21. But God struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because 70 of them, uh, putting 70 of them to death because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the, uh, the Lord had dealt them. And the men of Beth Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Then they sent messengers to the people of kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your place. So the narrator here, he gives us some devastating news. Seventy men of Beth Shemesh died. They weren't killed by a plague. They weren't killed by the tumors. They weren't killed by some freak accident. They weren't killed by a, a fire bursting out of control in the, in the dry field that they were harvesting. Our text says that God struck them down because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Now that may seem 
to us to be a very heavy price to pay for being curious about what was in the ark. But death, death was the penalty for looking wrongly at holy things. You know, as, I, as I read this through the week, I asked myself why these men would have felt the need to look into that ark. Surely they must have known what the penalty was. They were Levites and priests. What would cause them to be disobedient to the Lord? I guess, you know, idle curiosity was probably part of it. I mean, that would have been a natural thing. The ark is there. Why not take a little peek inside? You never know if you're going to ever get another chance to be that close to it. I mean, that might, might have been enough of a reason. But the simple act of looking into the ark demonstrated a lack of belief in the power of God. If God said, don't look into it or touch it or you'll die, then looking into it would mean that you're not really convinced that God could or would carry out the sentence that he's, he prescribed. In the case of the, the men of Beth Shemesh, I think that they just wanted to make sure that everything was still intact within, within the ark there. You know? I mean, after all, it's been in the hands of the Philistines for seven months. Maybe, maybe they took something out of it. You know? That would have been basically saying that you didn't believe that God was capable of protecting his own ark against the Philistines. That he wasn't more powerful than the Philistine army or the Philistine leaders. I mean, that would be much more severe than just idle curiosity, although the penalty would have been the same. Death. See, disobedience to God leads to death. It's a lesson that Adam learned in the garden. And it's a lesson that's been learned by everyone since. As Romans 6.23 teaches, the wages of sin is death. Here, with the men of Beth Shemesh, God demonstrated that he has power over the disobedient. See, the power of God is not to be trifled with. It might seem that for a while people get away with it. After all, these people, there are people all around us who seem to get along fine Denying God, defying God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that sometimes we even join in. I mean, after all, it looks like there aren't any real consequences. It looks as though you can get away with it. But the truth is that sin will catch up with you. Perhaps you'll get away with it for a season. But as we've seen this morning, the power of God is real. And it should cause us to tremble before him. Do you find yourself trembling before God when you have defied him? Do you find yourself trembling for those who are defying him and his power? The time of reckoning is coming. And it's coming sooner than we ever want to believe. For some, it could be today. For some, tomorrow. Or the next day. We just don't know. But it is coming. In our passage today, we saw that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had been captured and carried away, but it couldn't be Other so-called gods fall before it, and it brings destruction to the enemies of God. But the ark was returned to Israel, not by their might, not by anything that they could possibly have done. It was brought back by the power of God alone. You know, it's hard to think about this story without calling to mind another one. You see... The Ark of the Covenant contained the, 
<coughs> excuse me, the Ark of the Covenant contained the Word of God. The Word was given to Moses for the people of Israel. It contained the covenant that God had made with His people. Some 1,100 years later, John tells us that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. See, Jesus Christ was that Word that was made flesh. He was the ark that is the Word. And His blood is what sealed the new covenant that God was making with His people. The ark was also captured by the enemies of God and carried away. They arrested Jesus, the Word of God, in the dark of night. They drug Him before human courts as though they had power over Him. See, they thought that they could control Him. They thought they could hold Him and control Him by killing Him and, and placing Him in a tomb. Like their brothers earlier, Jesus' disciples must have thought that the glory of God had departed from them. But three days later, the ark returned as Jesus rose from that grave. His enemies were <coughs> unable to hold him. The final enemy, death, could not hold him. And God displayed His power to the whole world through His Son, Jesus the Christ. And He is the very same God who has the very same power who offers you eternal life through the work of His Son. He's calling you to come to Him for rest for your weary soul. He's calling you to experience the joy of being adopted as a child of God. To know that nothing could ever separate you from His love. That's the power of God. You know, God's power is demonstrated every day. As we look around, we can see Him at work if we'll look. So the question that I have for you this morning is this. How will you respond to the power of God? Does the power of God bring you fear? Or does it bring you joy? It's a question that you'll have to answer. Will you approach God as an enemy? Or as his child? Paul tells us that the gospel... The good news of Jesus Christ is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You know, God will demonstrate His power. There is no doubt. And it's the power of life and death. Not just for physical life, but for eternal life. So where will you stand? Will you come to Him and accept the gift of eternal life? Or will you be standing on the outside when the time comes for judgment? That's a decision that only you can make. Come to Jesus. And see the power of God at work in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. and. Lord, just how it teaches us and what it teaches us about you. Father, we admit that there's so many times and we, we, we kind of kind of want to try to put you in a box. That, that Lord, we try to, to, to see limits to your power, limits to the things that you can do. But Father, you're beyond anything that we can even imagine. If we can imagine the biggest thing, Lord, it is nothing compared to you. Father, you hold the universe in your hand. You know, as George asked about the, the, <coughs> the five miracles, Lord, I just 
First one I thought of after my salvation was that I'm standing here breathing. Lord, you hold the universe together. You are the giver of life. But you also hold the power of death. So Lord, I pray, Father, that if there's anyone hearing this who does not know Jesus as their Savior, that Father, they would come and that they would know that Jesus died for them. He took the sting of death so that we could have everlasting life. Father, I just rejoice. I rejoice in seeing you at work each day. Knowing, Lord, that you have uh, what is good in store. Lord, our circumstances may not be great. But, Father, we know that you hold those and that you are using those for good. Help us, Lord, as we try to, to live a life that honors you. To understand that you have all the power. And Father, all we have to do is ask. And that, Lord, you will come to our rescue. Father, I rejoice in that. Lord, help us. Help us each day. Live a life that honors you and glorifies you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.